I know that the title can be a little bit uh, um, interesting for you because typically I don't do anything that's controversial. But, but the moderation controversy is what I want to talk about today. And, and it's, it's a subject that, that oftentimes you find people on both sides of the fence. Whenever it comes to the word, can you turn down the gain just a little bit on mine? And perfect. And so I just want to really just bring to you my heart and some stuff that God's been working on me with whenever it comes to to ministering the word, to living out the life that God's called us to live out to take the word for what it is, to not water it down, not candy coat it, and how can we apply these things in our lives. So, don't get too bent out of shape about the title. We'll work it out. By the end, you'll probably be a little bit better with it. We'll bring a biblical perspective, if you will. So let's pray. Good morning, Father. Lord, help us to receive your word today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts. Help us to understand what you want us to, how you want us to apply this this to our lives, God. What you want us to use in moderation and, and, and what not, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, First and foremost, I want to let you know that we are not called to a ministry of moderation. You're not called to a ministry of moderation. I know. I know. That's a tough one, right? You're like, where are you going with this, Briggs? (laughs) Just wait. It gets better. (laughs) So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a lot of scripture verses, but I may or may not give you all the passages. Becky will have the passages. Becky, I emailed you the passages. So, but, and I can get them to you as well if you want. But there's so much in here that I don't want to, I don't want to skip a whole lot. Well, I am skipping a whole lot, a, a ton. I couldn't, I couldn't bring all this to you today, you know. In, in every way that God gives these examples, in every way that he lays it out for us. So I'm going to hit some that, that he just put on my heart, and, and we'll roll with those. But in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, Yet God has, not, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in humans' heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. It tells us that he planted this this understanding of, of eternity forever in our hearts. Yet we can't even comprehend, even come close to comprehending the scope of that, of how massive that is. But I do want to propose that maybe we don't know everything. Maybe we don't understand God completely. His ways, all the things that he does. How many times have you asked yourself, how could God do this? Or this couldn't be God because this, this, this. Does he really fit in your little box? Is God really that small that you can understand him fully? I mean, he gives us the Holy Spirit that teaches us all things, reveals all things to us. But how foolish would we be to think that the God that created everything, that we would be able to comprehend all the decisions that he made, that he does make, that he continues to make, 
I propose that the best thing we can do is search out his word to learn him, to learn about him more, to get to know him better, and just trust him that his ways are not our ways, that they're higher than ours, you know? I love the conversation that he's having with Job. If you haven't read Job, you should, but that's one of those books where you go, how can a God that loves us do that? God literally said, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless. <laughs> You're telling me, God, that this blameless guy, the, the only blameless guy at the time that, that we know of, I mean, the most blameless guy at the time at least, and you let these things happen, why, God? Why, God, would you do something like that? Have you ever found yourself asking that question? Job had to go for a while, dealing with some pretty nasty stuff, rough stuff, bad stuff, hard stuff, stuff we don't ever want to have to deal with. But then God came through at the end and blessed him beyond measure. So much more than even what he had in the beginning when he was righteous. He went through some suffering, but then whenever he starts to question, God says, Job, do you know where the rain comes from? Seriously? Do you know about what's in the depth of the ocean? And Job's like, no. No, I guess I don't. <laughs> and that should probably be our answer to ourselves when we're asking that question. God, how can you? And he says, just wait. Just wait. We look at things through this through this lens of time. Like I've got a timer set on my phone so I don't keep you guys here all day long. We look at things in time. God's the God of eternity. Yesterday, today, and forever. The forever there is what we need to start trying to wrap our minds around. So, we don't know everything. However, we are called to be like Christ, and he's all in. He's all in. He's not part way. He's not like I am with my, my sidewalk that I started, and it's not done yet. I started it a couple of years ago, right, Bill? Probably something like that. My wife told me the other day, yesterday, she said, if this bench out here ends up like my sidewalk, I'm going to burn it. And I'm like, well, then burn it. I got it for you. Do whatever you want with it. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I didn't say that, so don't tell her. <laughs> yes, you do. All right. So, a little bit about, about God, about Jesus. I told you that he's all in. He didn't do what was comfortable. Jesus, when he was here, he didn't do what was comfortable. Believe me. Carpenter son. Anybody ever smash their thumb with, with a hammer? <laughs> Steve's like, pow! You win. You were the first one. Well, so have I. And he had to learn things. He still had to learn things, but he's still God, right? He's still, Jesus is God. But he was all in. He didn't do things that, that were comfortable. He didn't do anything that was halfway. Like my sidewalk. It's a little more than halfway. But he didn't do anything like that. What he did was all the way. It was all the way. He didn't halfway heal people. He didn't halfway walk on water. He didn't halfway feed 5,000 people. And he didn't halfway get crucified. He got it all. He did it all. He went all the way. And we're supposed to be like Christ. When he loved people, he loved people. He wasn't holding back. He didn't have the restrictions and allow the, allow the well, I'm going to love this person, but not this person, because this person's weird. I don't like this person. This person does this. That wasn't him. He loved the unlovable. He didn't halfway do it. He did it all the way. I find myself only going halfway, though, sometimes. 
And it was convicting me big time. It still convicts me. That's why I'm preaching about it. I'm not perfect. I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. But guys, we have to keep this stuff at the forefront of our mind. He went all the way in everything that he did. Very important that we do too. Now the Bible talks about doing things in moderation. Can somebody give me an example of something that we should do in moderation? Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be in the Bible. What do you think we should do in moderation? Eat. Eat in moderation. Yes. Very much so. Something else. Exercise. Yes. What? Sleep. Oh, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that one. That one's getting tougher and tougher for me. What in the world? Why do I want to sleep so much? Something's going on. Y'all need to pray for me. What else? What else should we do in moderation? Or, or this is just good for us to do in moderation. Come on, I know there's more. You know I'm going to give you some, some examples, right? What? Play? Play in moderation? Yes. That's, that's tough for us guys, though, right? Like, the older we get, we still won't play as much as we did when we were kids. What's up with that? Well, I like it like that. So, so whatever. <clears throat> Moderation does has, have its place. However, it's mostly with, with food and drink, things like that, but it's never with your ministry. It's never with your ministry. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. What about family? What about kids? Yes. All those things. I'm not saying like with, with me being a pastor, Rod being a pastor, that we're supposed to be here in this church every day, all day, not doing anything else like a monk. They do have some cool clothes, and I've already got the haircut. <laughs> Work on it. Work on it, Rod. But, but what I'm saying is, what we're called to in our ministry, that's who we are. That's who we are. God created you that way. Let me give you some examples in here. Here's some things that the Bible says, and it's just kind of a short list, what the Bible says that we should do in moderation. Um, first... This one, is, I put this one first for my wife because I love her and I always put her first. <clears throat> he who blesses his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it will be counted as a curse to him. <laughs> so, maybe I should do that in moderation. Right, baby? I come in, she's like, shut your mouth. Don't say anything. Shh, it's quiet time. She doesn't say that, but that's what, that's what her face says. Anybody ever, you know what I'm talking about? It would be counted as a curse. So if, if you do that in moderation, that's going to be good for you, you know? That's Proverbs 27, 14. Uh, several of these are out of Proverbs because the book of wisdom. <clears throat> Proverbs 23, 1 through 3 says, When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you, Here's how important it is. And put a knife to your throat. If you are a man given to appetite, do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. So if you're sitting down with somebody, don't, don't eat like a pig. Think this through, you know, because they're going to form an opinion, and they may be able to have some sway over over what comes next, right? Proverbs 25, 16. Have you found honey? I've found my honey. Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. So like you said, eat. Eat in moderation. But whenever you get something that's really good, like if this was written to me, if my, my parents wrote it to me, it would say, if you find ice cream, eat only enough. 
Well, I've, I don't think I've ever vomited ice cream, but I could. I'm telling you, I, I could eat so much ice cream that I would vomit it up. But then, you know, that might be a plus because then I could eat more. That's kind of counterproductive here, isn't it? Scratch that. Scratch that. This one is super interesting, and I love it, and Brittany's going to probably be like, you should take your own advice on that. It's not my advice, it's God's advice. Proverbs 23, 4 through 5, do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away like an eagle toward heaven. We spend all of our lives working ourselves to death. And sometimes when we focus on that so much, we miss the things like our kids growing up. You know, my, some friends commented yesterday, several friends have made this comment, but they're like, dude, you're kids. They are not kids anymore. What in the world? I saw a picture your wife posted on, on social media. They're like, they're women, all of them. I'm like, yeah, shut your mouth. <laughs> Don't need to hear that, you know? And when the time runs out for this physical body here on this physical earth, we're not going to look back and we're not going to say, how much money did I make? Man, <laughs> wasn't I cool? I made so much money. You're not. We're not. We're going to think about the, the experiences we missed, the opportunities we missed. Now, I understand there's times where that is, sometimes that's unavoidable, you know. I'm not saying don't work and provide for your family. Work and provide for your family. The Word says if you don't eat, or if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, I mean, that's the way it is. But it also says that if other people can't, and we have plenty, we should be giving to them. That's loving. That's loving. Proverbs 25, 17. Seldom step foot in your neighbor's home, lest he become weary of you and hate you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm not saying y'all can't come over to my house. You can anytime, almost any time you like. Let me check with my wife. Okay. 1 Timothy 5.23, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Drink a little wine for your stomach. Now, Paul's talking to Timothy there, and obviously he's had some digestion issues. But he's saying, in moderation, I could go on and on about different places that it talks about. <clears throat> Don't drink too much wine. Don't become drunk. That's a huge one. Anytime people think about moderation in the Word, they immediately go to alcoholic beverages. That is what it is. If, if that bothers you, then don't do it, you know? But definitely, it tells us specifically, don't do too much. Don't become drunk. There are things that are very good to do in moderation. There are. There's just no doubt about it. There absolutely are. Now I'm going to bring up some verses and some, some examples that, that God uses where he doesn't do it in moderation. And I'm sure that all of you out there, like, you got thoughts just going off in your head. I know I did. In fact, when I was hitting snooze, because I love sleep, even this morning, I had, like, references just bam, 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 bam. I had to grab my notebook and start writing them down, so... I didn't have nearly this many before this morning, so sorry. What's that? I forgot one? What is it? Proverbs 6. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Proverbs 6, 5 through 10, you said? Chapter 6, 10 through 12. If you all want to know where the sleep one is, talking about little sleep, that's where it is. You almost got the mic there for a second. <laughs> Ephesians 
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's, it's literally talking about him who does exceedingly and abundantly above what we can ask or think. That's our God. That's our God that wants to do that for you. That's our example. Malachi 3.10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. God himself says this. And see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to contain it. That's our God. He's telling you, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is he's not giving to you in moderation. He's not moderately blessing you. If you do what he says, he's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing on you. That's our God. That has zero to do with moderation and only everything to do with abundance. In excess is what he's doing. Think about when when God parted the waters. He did that five times in the Word. We only think of uh, Moses, right? Moses parted the Red Sea. Well, God parted it. He told Moses what to do. Moses obeyed and God... God went to work. He didn't go to work in a little way, though. This is the Red Sea. It's huge. Have you ever looked on a map where they went across? It's big. It's really, really big. He parts the waters, dries up the ground, and lets them walk through. That's pretty excessive. I think that's amazing. He could have, I don't know, you remember whenever Jesus walked on water? He probably could have made them walk on water. That would have been pretty cool, too. But I think he wanted, he wanted to be the first one to do that, I think. But he parts the waters. That's not the first time. In Genesis, it's uh, one, Genesis 1, 6 through 7, it says, And God separated the waters from the dry ground. God did that. That's pretty big, right? The entire earth separating the waters and seas and all that stuff. But then Moses. Then after Moses... Joshua came to a point where he needed the water separated. And it says that God held the waters up. They were in flood stage. That means there was so much water coming through here. They were in flood stage, and God, boom, stopped it. And it says that it built up this big water. (sighs) That would have scared the goodness sakes out of me. Think about that. You're like, ready? Please stay there. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) I would have been trying to get across that thing. <laughs> but then as soon as they get across, God's like, boop. It says the priest got through. They got the Ark of the Covenant through on dry ground. And as, as soon as the priest's foot steps where, it wouldn't, where they wouldn't be affected, it went whoosh. <gasps> <gasps> Whoo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Joshua, like, God told Joshua that he, that he was going to do this so that they would recognize that the power of God was with Joshua, just like he was with Moses. The power of God was with Joshua, just like he was with Moses. You know that same power is in each one of you? If you accept it to be. If you accept it. If you walk with it. You get to operate in excess, in abundance not in moderation. You get to use that power in excess, not in moderation. Why? Not so you will get the glory. Not so I will get the glory, but so that God will get the glory. There's a couple other times. Elijah, filled with the Holy Spirit, strikes his cloak on the water and separates so he can go through. That is super cool. But then Elijah gets taken into heaven by a whirlwind. People are like, where'd Elijah go? Or Elijah, sorry. Where'd Elijah go? 
And they send out a search party. He's like, no, dude. Elisha's like, no, man, I just, I watched him. He went, his cloak fell down. Here's his cloak, I got it. Then he walks up to the water and he says, may the God that was with Elijah be with me and strikes the water, phew, it parts. What? That's, that's stuff you see in movies. But guess what? Where do you think the people got the idea for the movies? Our God, because he already did it. <laughs> How cool is that? That's awesome. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 4. There's a valley of dry bones that God shows Ezekiel, and he says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, only you know, God. Only you know. It's probably, he didn't phrase it like in that manner, I'm sure. But then God shows him. Meat coming onto these bones, veins going through there, blood coming in there, skin, breath, life comes into these bones, and a whole army rises up. That's our God. Is that, did he only pick a couple of them? Did he only pick one guy? No, the whole army, the whole army. Here's how powerful our God is. When, when Lazarus dies, Jesus comes up to the grave, and he has to call Lazarus by name because if he didn't, whoever else was dead in there would have came forth. If he would have just said, hey, guys, they would all came forth. But just Lazarus did. He used a little bit of self-control there, I guess, probably. But speaking of raising people from the dead, he didn't use any moderation whenever Jesus died and was buried and rose again because it says whenever Jesus died, the rock split open, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Now we can enter into the Holy of Holies. We can have this relationship with God. But it also says that the body of, what was it, like tons of saints came up out of the, out of the grave and were walking around in the city and they were seen by lots of people. That's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. That's not, that's not a picture of moderation in my mind, you know? That's God saying, let's get to work. Let's do this. Mark 11, 20, 12 through 25, it's where Jesus cursed the fig tree. He curses a fig tree. Now, you're like, what, what difference does that make? Why, why would Jesus curse a fig tree? First of all, it wasn't even season for figs to be on the tree. Jesus went to it looking for figs on a tree that it wasn't even seasoned for. So you're like, why would he do that? Why would he curse the tree if it wasn't even seasoned for it? He's proving a point. You got the power of life and death in your tongue. Use it. Use it wisely. Do what you're going to do with it so that I will get the glory. And then whenever that, his disciples ask, they're like, Jesus... What happened here? And Jesus says, you think that's cool. If you believe, if you even have enough faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, teeny tiny, if you've got a little tiny bit of faith, you can say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, and it will be cast into the sea. He used killing this fig tree to set the, to set the stage for this, to show them this is nothing. They had never seen someone or even heard of someone curse a tree and it just wither up. Like what kind of spiritual aspect does that have to it? We can go a lot of places with that, but I'm just saying, think about, think about this. He didn't, he wasn't holding back. That wasn't done out of moderation. That was done out of some, some a heart to show us how extreme we can be if we're walking in him. Numbers 16.32, I talked about this a while back, the, uh, the dudes that wanted to go against um, Moses and Aaron, and they're speaking against them, and God opens up the ground and swallows their whole family, them, their family, everything, swallows it up, closes it back up. Tell me, tell me there's some moderation in there. That's, I don't see it. That's pretty stinking extreme. That's crazy. That's wild. But that's our God. That's our God. That's how he operates. You're like, a loving God opened up the ground and swallowed people? 
Yes, for a point. Needed to happen. It did. It did. But that's our God. Wild. In Numbers 33, uh, verse 52, God tells the Israelites to drive out all the people of the land. All the people of the land. He said, don't leave any of them. Don't leave any of them. And then take their idols and destroy them completely. Destroy their idols completely. We're talking God, this loving God that created you and I, told these people to wipe out entire people groups and rid the world of them. Now, there's some pretty deep reasoning why, but that's extreme. He didn't say, you can wipe all these people out, but leave this group, leave that group and that group, and we'll see about them. We're going to do this in moderation. That's not what he said. Wipe them all out. The plagues of Egypt. The only thing that I can see him doing in moderation there is he only killed the firstborn. The rest of the plagues leading up to that, we're talking he sent all the locusts. He took away all the light. He turned all the water to blood. He did all these things, these ten plagues, he didn't hold back. That's nuts. That's wild. We're talking all the frogs, all the gnats. That's wild. In Revelations 3.15, God tells us, now this is the angel of the Lord coming down, speaking to John. He tells us, I would rather you be hot or you be cold. If you want to live here in, in moderation, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Be hot or be cold. If you're not, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Yet, yet here we are. We want to live in this place of limbo. We want to be like, well, I'm going to be a Christian today because it's Sunday morning. But then over here Friday night, we're like, nts, nts, nts. you know? Later, Paul. <laughs> but seriously, we pick and choose when we want to follow God. We pick and choose when we're going to live for Him. We pick and choose what's convenient for us, comfortable for us. How dare we? Who are we? Is that our choice? Yes, it's your choice. He says, choose this day who you will serve. To either serve Him or don't serve Him. Isaiah 40, 13 through 14, and tons more. God is an all-knowing and all-powerful God. All-knowing and all-powerful. He doesn't just know in part. He knows it all. He's not kind of powerful. He is all-powerful. There's no in-between with Him. He knows it all. There's nothing He can't do. Mark 16, 15, and Matthew 28, 19, He says, go into all the earth go into all the nations preaching the gospel evangelizing telling people about this relationship of the only person the only way they can be saved the only way they can go to heaven the only way that they can live an abundant life a fulfilled life he's the only way there is no other way the only one is him What is salt that has lost its flavor? It's nothing. It's nothing. It may look like salt. It's not going to taste like salt. It's not going to do anything. It's not even good for anything. When we as, quick, as Christians, <clears throat> when we lose our flavor, what are we good for? Let me ask you something. Why do you think that God gave us the ability to heal the sick, to raise the dead, and to cast out demons? For us to look cool? 
No. He gave us this power, this ability, this authority to take so that we bring him glory and honor, so that people see that he's real. But yet we're not stepping out. We're not doing what he's telling us to do, to heal these sick people, to raise people from the dead, to cast out demons. Why would anybody think that we serve a powerful God if we don't even take the step? People are like, well, I, I don't see healings anymore. Well, when was the last time you laid hands on somebody and commanded them to be healed? If you haven't seen somebody raised from the dead, stick around, it's coming. It is. And God wants to use you to do it. He wants to use me to do it. He's going to use us in this church to do it. But unless we're walking around, there's dead people in here, we can't really pray for them. You know what I mean? We can't command them to come up, come back to life. I hope God doesn't bring us some dead people in here. But we should still go out and do what he's told us to do. There are sick people in here, and they should all be healed. This body right here, if we stop trying to operate out of moderation, if we try to stop, if we stop just, just trying to just get by because we know that we accepted God in our lives, so we're going to heaven, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. Yeah, but what about the people God put in your life that he put in your path? Are they good enough? No, that's why you live, so that you can bring these people with you. If salt's lost its flavor, it's good for nothing. This, uh, this quote, I, I actually put this station together a long time ago, and this quote, I don't know, is just like stuck in my head. And it's a little, it's kind of extreme, so bear with me, but that's what I do. If you're a Christian that's not doing anything for Christ, not doing what you've been called to do or being, what you've, or being who you've been called to be, you might as well not even leave your house because you're probably doing more harm than good. Now, I'm sure you're like, Briggs, <laughs> that's a little over the top. You're probably doing more harm than good. Let me ask you this. Have you ever heard, I don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites? That's what I mean. I'm guilty of this. I'm not looking at you going, you sinners. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm saying, look at me. I've been in the same spot. Do you see me walking around and every single sick person, they sneeze and I'm like, God bless you, be healed. And now they're, they're healed? No, but I'm getting there. I'm working on it and I want to get there with you. I want to get there with you guys. But I don't want people to say about Church on the Rock or about any other Christians because of us, I'm not going to church because it's full of hypocrites. They say they serve a powerful God. This guy prayed, nothing happened. God isn't real. No, I don't ever want that to be said about me. I don't ever want to walk around in moderation. I want to be the guy that God created me to be. The example that he set for me, I should be walking in that. And in fact, everybody that sees me, that I come in contact with, they should go, wow, there's something different about that guy. Some of them do get used to different I'm kind of used to different, but I'm talking in a whole nother level. You know, God created me different. He created you different. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be like him. We're called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. We're supposed to do it with everything, not just a little bit. And then we're supposed to love others as ourselves, not in moderation, that's not one of the things that he says that we should do in moderation. It's not honey. It's not wine. It's not talking early in the morning. That's not one of the things that we should be doing in moderation. We've got to love hard. We've got to love him hard, and we've got to love each other hard. Do you fully love as he has called you to? Do we? 
fully love as he's called us to. Do I? Are we looking like Christ? We're Christians. Are we looking like it? I want to look like, literally, I want my life to look like, like Christ's life looked, like loving people. He says, this is my command, that you love one another. I want to look like that. Now, my face, God gave me this face that doesn't always look happy. I'm typically happy, though. But my face, people are like, what's wrong with him? Like nothing. I'm happy as can be. I'm going to like get some stitches or something. You know, like <laughs> it's just my face. I'm sorry. Now, Jesus, he was what we would call a little extreme. We've heard of extremist groups. Oh, they're, they're radical Christians. This, these people are extreme. They're too extreme. I have people that don't hang out with me because I'm extreme sometimes. I'm dialing it down a lot. I think it's because maybe I'm, I'm low on testosterone or something. I don't know. But Jesus, Jesus was extreme. It's who he was. And you know what? He had thousands of people wanting to follow him everywhere that he went. Wanting to be by him. Because he was extreme. <laughs> this is the dude that made a, a, a whip in the house of God and started beating people, running them out. Because they wanted to taint his house. They, want, they didn't want to be all in. They weren't there for God. They were there for them. He said, how dare you turn my house into this, my father's house into this? This Jesus, the same one. He was loving them in that, correcting them, bringing correction so that they would know the difference. Think about, think about whenever Peter chops that dude's ear off. I know I've talked about it before, but it's pretty extreme. He chops this guy's ear off. And Jesus himself picks it up and puts it back on the dude's head. And he's there. The guy was there to take Jesus and murder him. Torture him to death. Jesus knew that's what was coming. That guy knew that's what was coming. And Jesus loved him enough, picked that ear up and stuck it back on his head. Mind-blowing. That's a little extreme, isn't it? He didn't, like, attach half of it. I probably would have, just like maybe, but made it stick out a little bit, put it on upside down, you know? He didn't do that, though. He went all the way, and he did it right. Jesus said, even if you love your life unto death, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. You will find life. You'll find it more abundantly, better than it ever was before. But we want to hold on to this life. We want to, we want to make sure that it's comfortable for us. Would we put ourselves in a situation that we might die for God? That we might die for Jesus? That we might die for this relationship? That we might die so that other people could have what we have. That's a scary thought. But that's what he tells us. They, those weren't my words. I didn't just pencil it in. John 6, 53 through 58. And in order to follow me, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. He wasn't talking about cannibalism. <laughs> that's, that's not the case here. He's talking about consuming who he is what he's doing for us what he's done for us that's what he's talking about but that statement alone made hundreds of people leave him hundreds in luke 14 26 he says and you must hate your family he's not saying hate your family for goodness sakes the 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 second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself 
to love God and to love others. Second greatest commandment. So what does he mean? You must hate your family in comparison to going all in after him. It, it would look like that. This, this earthly sense of, of us, even, even the love that we have for our families. We've got to go so much harder after him. Be willing to leave everything if he says to leave everything. Luke 9.23 says that you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. The cross, guys, was a horrific symbol of torture, humiliation, and ultimately death. And Jesus used that symbolism before he went to the cross and was brutally tortured, tormented, and murdered. And he tells us that you have to take up your cross and you have to follow after me. You have to be willing to take on suffering. People are going to hate you. People are going to think you're nuts. All these things. But it's okay. It's okay. He's got you. Matthew 10, 38 through 39 says, Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Are you serious? God, are you serious? I can't just, I can't just do my own thing and still be worthy of you? Because I want to. That's how I've lived my whole life. I know you love me enough, God. He does love you enough. Do you love him enough? Do I love him enough? For us to think that he's selfish to do this, he's the one that willingly went to the cross to take on your sin, to take on your shame and the, the nastiness that's in you so that all you have to do is accept him, love him, and follow him. That's it. That's it. Just give up yourself. I don't know if it's just me or if, if we've just become comfortable in not taking up our cross and in sugarcoating our lack of commitment and using the excuse of moderation to do it. We use the excuse we don't want to wear ourselves out so that we won't be any good for anyone. We're using the excuse of moderation. Yet we should be pouring ourselves out as a drink offering to the Lord. You're like, what's that even mean? Well, in Philippians 2.17, it says, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. This is Paul. He's, he's in prison. He knows he's going to die. Knows it. He says, even if I have to be poured out as a drink offering, that my life, that you can view what I've done, so as an example, if I have to be poured out like that, my life be poured out for you, then I'm glad, and I will rejoice with you. He uses the same terminology again in 2 Timothy 4, 5 through 6. He says, but you, be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work of, of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's telling Timothy and the people there, this is what, what you need to do. You need to understand you're not going to live forever in this, in this earthly body. You're not. He says, I'm coming to my end. I'm not going to live forever. I'm about to be poured out. You're going to see it. And he did. He lost his head over it. But we should be sacrificing our own lives, being crucified with Christ, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. 
Now the life that I live in the flesh, this life that we live in the flesh, we need to live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He already did it. He did it already. James 2.26 says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. A lot of people are like, Nathan, you don't have to do anything to be saved. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, God loves you enough. Jesus loves you enough. He paid the ultimate price for you so that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that you are saved, you will be saved. Yep. But what kind of example are we to everybody else that needs to have this relationship with God if we aren't walking out our faith in what we do, in what we say, in how we live, how we represent Him? It's a, it's a fence that but I don't think he wants us to straddle, honestly. Now, this is the way of life that we must adopt in order to truly make Jesus famous. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 10. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God. He's reminding him. Fan into flames the gift of God of God that you have. If you're fanning something into flames, it's just this little flame, but then you fan it and it grows and it grows and it grows, more people are going to see it. More people are going to be affected by it. They can see the light. They can use the light. They can can get warmth from it. It's a good thing. Fan it into flames. He says, fan this into flames, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power love, and a sound mind. Why do you think that that Paul said that right there? He says, he's telling him to fan these gifts that God has put into him, fan them into flames. But why? He's telling him that God didn't give you a spirit of fear. So maybe Timothy was struggling with fear, like, I don't want to step out. I'm too afraid to step out. I've seen you do it, and you're really good at it. He's like, yeah, I know, but I'm I'm about to die. (laughs) You have to affect your area of influence. He says, don't be afraid. God gave you the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Don't be ashamed of what God has done in you. We overcome by the power of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The life that you lived, yeah, you might be embarrassed about it. I'm embarrassed about my past life. But God has used that time and time again to minister to people to say, See, if Nathan can do it, you can do it. I'm 100% serious. He says, Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed about the testimony about our Lord nor his prisoner, Paul, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God. He's saying you can't do it on your own. You have to have God's power to be able to do this, what I'm commanding you to do. By the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gives us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. He gave this to us, the ability to be called sons of God, to walk out what he's called us to do, even if it, like Paul, leads us to our death, or almost any of the other disciples except for John. Guys, this is not, this is not a life for the faint-hearted. It's not a life for people that don't, don't want to be all in. It's just not. He gave us Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. How do we do this? Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might and not by power, 
but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's how we do it. In Philippians 4.13, it says we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. He's the one that gives us strength. Not our power, not our might, but by the Spirit. He's the one that does it. And in Matthew 19, 26, he says, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, this can be a little bit of a heavy message because we all like being comfortable. I get it. And maybe there's parts that I presented in a way that you're like, that that's, doesn't line up all the way. Have I been wrong before? Yes. Am I going to be wrong again? Yes. Could I have been wrong with some of this stuff today? Yeah. And if I am, I truly am sorry. I didn't mean to be. But what I do hope that you got out of today is that we need to light a fire. We need to let that fire ignite within us. We need to go after God with everything that we are, with every ounce of energy that we have. We need to go after him with energy that we don't have. We need to ask him to be that in us. We need to be willing to seek him, love him, go after him with everything, and then watch what he does through us. That's what I'm telling you today. If you were sitting out there today and you're like, Nathan, you brought that word and it, it, it convicted me. I didn't bring it to convict you. That's not what today's about. It's just not. I hope that it stirs something up in you. I hope that we will be able to walk out more diligently what he's called us to so that the world can see him. So that the world will want to see him. So that they don't go, ah, oh, that's boring. That's nothing. A God that raises people from the dead is not boring. A God that splits open the sea so we can walk through is not boring. Not even remotely close. I'm ready to change inside myself. I'm ready to let him change me. And I'm ready to change the world because of it. So, I love you guys. That's what I have for you today. And uh, if anybody has anything that they need prayer over, come up and see us. If you don't have a relationship with this God that I'm talking about, come up and see us. Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. Let's introduce you.